Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other cool organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Corey Zetz. Corey is the executive director of the Menominee Valley Partners in Milwaukee. She was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and went to high school at Brecksville High School. And then she went to John Carroll University in Cleveland to study philosophy. She continued her studies in philosophy at Emory University in Atlanta. And then she got a master's degree in urban planning here at UW-Madison. Tonight, she's gonna to be speaking with us about transforming the Menominee Valley would you please join me in welcoming Corey Zetz to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thanks so much. I'm really excited to share the story of Milwaukee's Menominee River Valley and its transformation. Um, we'll spend the first half talking about the transformation and then talk about some of the lessons learned. So the Menominee River Valley is located right in the heart of Milwaukee, just west of Lake Michigan and downtown Milwaukee. It's surrounded by some of the largest destinations in the region, like American Family Field, Potawatomi Hotel and Casino, and the Harley-Davidson Museum. But historically, the Menominee River Valley was all a wild rice marsh. The word Menominee comes from the Algonquin words for Menomen, meaning good grain. It's where the native tribes who lived all around the, the valley and throughout the Great Lakes would gather every year for the wild rice harvest. The first permanent white trading post in, in Wisconsin was at the bluffs of the valley where the Mitchell Park Dome sit today, where Jacques View came and traded with the Potawatomi and other tribes during the harvest. So the valley has really been a great business location for more than 175 years. And the city of Milwaukee grew up around the valley. In the 1830s, after the Potawatomi, um, who had become the dominant tribe in the Milwaukee region, were displaced through the Treaty of Chicago, the city of Milwaukee's forefathers took on a massive um, public improvement project they called the Menominee, work, uh, Menominee Improvements, where they undertook the filling of the marshland. Um, they tore down the bluffs of the valley with horse and cart and brought the, the dirt to fill the marsh, as, as well as a lot of um, industrial uh, farm, stockyard, cattle waste. So through a long and um, pretty uh, arduous and not always sanitary process, the valley's marsh was filled. Um, the wetland became land. and it made way for industrial development. For more than 100 years, Milwaukee was known as the machine shop of the world. And during that time, the valley was its engine. Everything that made Milwaukee famous, from grain to transformation of cattle into meat and tanned hides, to fabrication of metals into large gear pro products and mining equipment, all that happened in the valley and the city grew up around it. The neighborhoods established themselves surrounding the valley as walk-to-work housing and became the densest, uh, most densely populated neighborhoods in the state of Wisconsin. But for generations of Milwaukeeans, as well as people just passing through Milwaukee, this is what, what was seen. And this was the legacy of the valley that people recall to this day. As industry started leaving, some moving out to the suburbs, some overseas, and some just shutting doors permanently, the valley was left with hundreds and hundreds of acres of abandoned factories, contaminated land, and a forgotten river. It also became the place that uses that residents didn't want anywhere else in the city were, were put. So stockyards, junkyards, scrapyards, things that residents didn't want in their neighborhoods, all became, the valley became the location for all those uses. And the Menominee River, once, once a, a, a wild marsh that, that fed hundreds of people, 
became a channelized and forgotten source of water. The river itself um, had no public access in, in the city of Milwaukee. Very few places you could even see it because it was um, bordered by private land or tall sheet pile walls. And the few places it was visible uh, were really filled with garbage and looked more like an open sewer than an actual river. And adding to the economic devastation the valley saw in the latter half of the 20th cent century, the environmental issues were real community issues. Um, the Menominee Valley was for generations known as the Mason-Dixon Line of Milwaukee. It was the divide between Milwaukee's black and white communities. And just over 50 years ago, NAACP youth, Father Grappi, and a number of other city leaders led marches across the valley, across the 16th Street Viaduct, mm -hmm. in an effort to, to see a fair housing bill passed that would end segregation in the city. So for 200 consecutive nights, people marched across the valley to demand fair housing. So in the, in the late 1990s, as the economic, environmental, and community cultural needs all came to a head, um, community leaders went to the city and asked for a real plan for what would happen with the Menominee Valley. Um, there were hundreds of acres of, of neglected land the communities, neighborhoods surrounding the valley were hit hard by um, job loss, unemployment, underemployment, and public health issues that went al along with that. Um, there was no access to the river, and the businesses who remained still didn't know if they had a, a long-term future because this was the place that, that any unwanted use came. So together, the community came together and, and demanded a plan, really asking for improved infrastructure, support for the businesses that were there, focus on potentially catalytic projects to bring additional development, and also recommended a public-private partnership to implement everything that was in the plan, knowing that these changes were bigger than anything that the city could do on its own. So in 1999, Menominee Valley Partners was born as that public-private partnership to implement the plan and really focus on the economic, environmental, and community issues of the area in the Menominee River Valley and beyond, with a goal to revitalize and sustain the valley as a thriving, thriving urban district that advances economic, ecological, and social equity for the greater Milwaukee community. So now I'll just run through some of the changes that have transpired in this 20 years of transformation. The first big projects that happened in the Valley is, is envisioned in that original plan more than 20 years ago were infrastructure improvements. So on the very east end of the Valley was the Sixth Street Viaduct. There were four viaducts that crossed the Valley and very few ways down into. So for, for generations, the Valley was a place that people passed over and only if you had a, a, a job down there would you have reason to go down there. So one of the first big efforts was to undertake bringing one of those viaducts down to grade and to touch the valley floor, making it a place that people went to rather than crossed over. And that Sixth Street viaduct was rebuilt as the Sixth Street bridges that cross over um, but touch down on the valley. And it was, those bridges landed on Canal Street which was surrounded by vacant land. It was a huge leap of faith to design this bridge to go to a place that really had very little. But it was also a signal that this was a place that had much yet to come and a place that was, uh, had a future that was yet to unfold. So this, those six street bridges really were the first um, indicator that the valley was on a, on a forward path. And today, those six street bridges are often filled with people. There are bike lanes and they connect to major destinations. This here is one of the Harley Davidson anniversary parties where the bridge is filled with uh, bikers, but people from across Milwaukee, from across Wisconsin, and from around the world who come to, 
to destinations and via the six street bridges. So I think we've really seen that transformation through infrastructure as that first step. And the second big piece of the infrastructure transformation was the rebuilding of Canal Street, um, which was done as a mitigation project for the rebuilding of the Marquette interchange um, at I-94 and I-43. Before then, Canal Street did not run all the way through the valley. In fact, there was no road that would take you from the east end to the west end. You had to get up to the bluffs, through the neighborhoods to find another way down. There was no single east-west street. And where there was a canal street running east-west, there were railroad tracks right down the middle of it. So if you were trying to get to work, get a shipment in, you might have to wait for a train passing to get, to get into your, your, your business. So Canal Street's reconstruction was transformative. You can see those two photos are taken from the same vantage point on the 16th Street viaduct overlooking the valley. And what was really a, a big step and a, a real success in this was not only was Canal Street rebuilt to provide vehicular access east and west to the whole valley, but through a partnership with the Department of Natural Resources, the Hank Aaron State Trail was constructed as part of that effort as well. Since the goal was really to create um, family supporting jobs in the Valley, once again, bring companies back and make them available to people in the surrounding communities. And we knew that through all the disinvestment in the neighborhoods, not everyone had access to a private car, had an easy way down to work, that creating a bike um, and walking trail that people could walk through the length of the Valley was important as a, as a workforce piece but also with the uh, hopes for environmental restoration and creation of public access to the river, that having a trail that connected people to natural resources was a goal as well. So at the same time, these two projects were built, Canal Street and the Hank Aaron State Trail that parallel each other and provide access throughout the entire valley. And today we say that the trail will take you there. 12 of the top 15 destinations in Southeast Wisconsin are right along the Hank Aaron State Trail. So from Lake Michigan, the Milwaukee Art Museum and Discovery World, the Harley Davidson Museum, American Family Field, State Fair Park, all these destinations you can get to off-road on a trail, all the way to the Milwaukee Waukesha County line where it meets up with another trail system. So really providing a spine east-west that connects workers to jobs as well as families to all the destinations that they'd wanna see in, in the region. So around that same time, work started on riverfront land. Most of the riverfront was for from almost a hundred years was coal coal storage for a coal gasification plant, a coal power plant. And seeing that land transform um, was, was one of the first milestones that showed that the Valley was really bringing back economic development. So that first big project was the construction of Marquette University's Valley Fields. Today, right along the Menominee River, a destination for, for sports, Division One soccer, but also Lots of community organizations that partner with Marquette to host um, their own games here. And that, that became a, a catalyst and development continued east along other former coal yards. Um, and we've seen more private businesses move in. This one here shows just one of the examples of where we've had former vacant land redeveloped, private businesses come in who then give an easement for the Hank Aaron State Trail to run in the back of their property, um, providing public access to the Menominee River. So on a, any given day, we'll see bikers and walkers, dog walkers, people fishing behind some of the private properties right here because there was public access uh, reestablished along the, the river. And then up until 2004, we had stockyards. The, Mo the mighty Milwaukee stockyards were right in the heart of the valley. Cows and pigs that were here for their 
uh, final days before moving into the nearby slaughterhouses to be processed into, um, into ground beef. Or, and then hides moved to the Valley's tanneries to come out as, as leather products. Back in 2004, we still had businesses down here in the Valley complaining about cows and pigs breaking out and, and blocking their loading docks or employees having a hard time getting to work because some cows were out in the street. Um, but the rest of the time, cows have these downtown skyline views. Um, and so through a, through a lot of partnerships, that land was acquired and redeveloped as the Canal Street Commerce Center, which now has over 200 employees, largely in uh, light assembly, um, light manufacturing and, and tech uses really, again, bringing jobs right back to the site and a more uh, productive economic use and a real generator of, uh, of jobs for the community. On the east end of the valley, the next big project was the redevelopment of a peninsula right at the confluence of the Menominee River and the South Menominee Canal, one of the two remaining canals from the days when the valley had nearly a dozen canals for, for private industry shipping and unloading. That site, about 20 acres, um, was the home of Morton Salt. So we had salt piles right here uh, up on the water. Again, not the highest and best use of waterfront land, but through, um, through partnerships that involve combining a number of small properties to make one contiguous site there, that property was redeveloped as the one and only Harley Davidson Museum, which today brings uh, more than a quarter million visitors to the region every year for the museum itself and the number of events that are held there. So that's been another big economic driver and a catalyst for, for development all around it. And the biggest project by far in the Valley has been the redevelopment of the former Milwaukee Road shop site. So the Milwaukee Road, I think a lot of people in, in Wisconsin rem remember those trains going through our state um, all the way to the Pacific, bearing the Milwaukee Road logo. Um, but in 86, the shops were closed. Um, trains ceased being manufactured and repaired here. And for more than 20 years, we were left with this abandoned factory. This was one of the first things you saw coming into Milwaukee from the West. And today, that site is the Menominee Valley Industrial Center and Community Park. We have a dozen businesses there, providing more than 1,400 family-supporting jobs and a really innovative green infrastructure system that captures every drop of rain that falls on the businesses and the roadways, uh, collects it in the shared stormwater treatment system that's in the foreground of the business park photo here, is a very engineered way of getting back to the valley's original purpose of being a wetland that cleaned and filtered water and also provides park space, trails, soccer fields, a number of uses that the community really wanted to see, um, both jobs and, and public space for our neighbors to enjoy. And as that project was developing, jobs were coming back, companies were hiring, and the, uh, the park space was being developed from the nearby neighborhoods. You could see it, but you couldn't get there because all of the historic connections between the valley and the neighborhoods, which were once walk to work housing, had disappeared. Bridges had come down and there was really no connectivity anymore. So as that was happening, Neighbors, neighborhood associations, um, the city, the state, both the Department of Transportation and Natural Resources, Menominee Valley Partners work together to figure out how to reconnect those. And today there is a bridge, the Valley Passage, that connects the Menominee Valley across the river to the Silver City neighborhood immediately south in the same location as the historic connections between the neighborhoods. 
that bridge is really, uh, again, a walk to work way for neighbors to get to jobs, as well as a way for residents to get to the park space and to the river. And really, we're, we're seeing more and more people from throughout the community using this infrastructure to connect. Um, from the neighborhood side in Silver City, um, that connection for more than a generation was a boarded up tunnel because it connected under railroad tracks. And so there, it was really a, also a blight on the neighborhood. But today, that Valley Passage connection is a switchback trail that connects neighbors and works as a gathering spot, um, a place where people come together and then meet before walking over to the valley. And the environmental progress continued uh, throughout this. And I think as more neighbors, more residents began building faith in the valley, knowing that, that the transformation was, was really gaining momentum, that companies were moving back, jobs were being created, there was some green space being created, that the, the demand really grew for improving the Menominee River itself, its water quality, as well as the public access to it. So this image is the Menominee River in 1997, around the time that Miller Park was originally being reconstructed. So you can see there were tall sheet pile walls that really kept people away from the water itself. It was brown and murky and really you, not a place that many people could see. So there really wasn't a lot of recognition that we have this river here as a potential resource. And when you did see it, it was not an inviting place. But this is that same stretch today. You know, just over 15 years later, we have kids in there. These, these two boys are sampling for macroinvertebrates through a school program with the Urban Ecology Center, capturing small little critters in the water that are indicators of water health. And the quality of the river has changed immensely. That you. These kids are, are demonstrating and, and the small creatures that they can capture with their dip nets, but we're also seeing that in the return of some of the, the big species. So if you come to visit the valley in the spring, April, um, you'll see the steelhead running. And in September and October, we have a really incredible salmon run. Um, and in the same stretch, right behind the ballpark, you can see people pulling out three foot salmon um, during the, the fall salmon run. So it's really become uh, an amazing story of resilience as, as we've seen the, the types of um, restoration efforts that have happened in the valley lead to increase in species and, and those species are drawing community down. And that restoration and transformation in the valley has also been moving out, um, moving its way into the surrounding neighborhoods. So this former bar um, abandoned in the neighborhood right next to that original connection with the bridge and the tunnel that connected the Silver City neighborhood to the south, um, right into the valley. This was a, a former bar with a rooming house above where employees of the Milwaukee Road worked. As plans developed for, for park space and river access, there was demand in the community for an environmental community center, something that really helped neighbors to get out and explore the natural resources that they had been cut off from for, for generations. And so that same building still stands today um, after quite a, a renovation as the Menominee Valley branch of the Urban Ecology Center, the community center and environmental education center that partners with schools within a two mile radius. To, so there are 22 schools surrounding the valley that get to come in for their hands-on science education through the Urban Ecology Center. Using this, this building as the gateway into the park and the river to do everything from, from sampling water quality in the river um, to learning about the birds and bats and um, reptiles that they can find in the habitat that is being restored in the valley. 
as well as community programs that run from early morning bird walks to late night bat and owl walks, really inviting the community in to experience and explore public space. And the biggest public space um, that opened the year after the Urban Ecology Center opened was Three Bridges Park. This was a transformation of the former rail switching yard of the Milwaukee Road Shops and a transformation of an abandoned rail yard that was again a, a barrier between neighborhoods and the restoration in the valley and a barrier be between neighborhoods and the river. So historically that whole area was part of the Milwaukee Road Shops and on the very right side you can see where the railroad um, switching yard was. So there were more than a dozen tracks there uh, where the cars would line up. In the early 2000s, when the Marquette Interchange was reconstructed, fill from that project, as well as crushed concrete from the old highway, was moved to the site. There were a couple of benefits with that. First, it, it raised the entire site out of the floodplain that enabled it to be redeveloped. But secondly, it, it created some interesting topography and some height that enabled um, connections between the valley and in the surrounding neighborhoods, which were still up on a bluff. And that's the site of Three Bridges Park today. And you can see that those dirt piles and crushed concrete from the Marquette Interchange have been shaped through a partnership with the UWM School of Geology. We found a way to turn those piles into eskers and canes and drumlins. The glacial topography that was indigenous to Southeast Wisconsin that had been lost when much of this area was redeveloped and, and the landforms were flattened to make way for industry and other development. So today, those landforms are recreated and to scale. So kids who are coming through their school programs to the Urban Ecology Center can learn about how the glaciers move through Wisconsin and created features like drumlins and canes and eskers um, and do some of that work right in the park space. Um, but it also lets the, the neighborhood connect across the still existing rail line um, that, that still is there um, to cross over with bike and pedestrian bridges um, by landing on some of those features. So in, those, in these last 20 years, the valley has really gone from, from an eyesore and really a, an embarrassment for the state of Wisconsin into a national model of economic development and environmental restoration. In that time, we've seen more than 300 acres of land be redeveloped, bringing more than 60 companies back to the valley. And those companies moving here have created more than 5,200 family supporting jobs for, for residents throughout the region. What was really thought of as a dirty contaminated area now boasts more than a million square feet of sustainably designed buildings, many of them with LEED certification, so very environmentally friendly. And now 60 acres of public parks and trails, including the Hank Aaron State Trail that wind through the valley. And today, a place that really had few access points and very few people coming to it for any, any reason at all, now boasts more than 10 million visitors a year between the large attractions like Brewers Games, Pottawatomie Hotel and Casino, Harley-Davidson Museum, as well as uh, the Urban Ecology Center, Three Bridges Park, and the Hank Aaron State Trail. And it's really become a place for everyone. And it's now getting all kinds of national attention. So just a few examples. Smithsonian Magazine recently ran an article about Milwaukee's secret salmon runs. Those, that Menominee River stretch that was just nothing but sheet pile wall and few species just 20 years ago is now boasting incredible salmon runs that are getting national attention as, as a great urban fishery. Politico magazine did a feature on, on the Valley a few years ago about how Milwaukee is really a model for other former Rust Belt cities. You know, we've shaken off the rust and kept going, um, developing the industrial 
heritage that we have here, but also greening it up all around. And Landscape Architecture magazine did a feature on the valley as well, uh, that, saying that this area with all its industrial history and still job generating industrial growth today is a model for landscape design. That we have really innovative systems here that, that deal with stormwater, that restore native species and habitats and create public space. So from the environmental to the, um, to the economic, to the community, the Valley still keeps um, pushing, pushing forward and building momentum. So I want to turn now to what are the lessons we've learned from the Valley that could be replicated anywhere else, um, you know, whether it's at the scale or, or smaller or larger. Uh, so Menominee Valley Partners took on a, a project with the Wisconsin Policy Forum a few years ago to really look at what were the lessons we can learn from the Valley and what can be replicated. We still have work to do here, but we've had a lot of questions and, um, and tours from communities across the country, as well as some from overseas who come to look at this, this mix of economic and environmental sustainability. So, so the Wisconsin Policy Forum spent some time studying the Valley, talking to stakeholders, and looking at what are, are things that we can learn from and, and share with other communities. So I thought I'd just run through these, these lessons learned. The first is the importance of robust planning and design activities that establish a common vision and then having a roadmap to, to see that vision through. So the planning is, is so important, but also all those steps to, to get from the vision um, to fruition. So for example, the former Milwaukee Road shop site, that's, that's what you see here when it was abandoned. This is about, about 2,000, uh, 120 acres of actual building space that was abandoned in the heart of the city. The goal here was a combination of economic development and environmental restoration. And so the city of Milwaukee took on a national design competition for this land because you don't often get opportunities to develop sites this big in the heart of a city and really wanted to make sure that we seized that opportunity and, and really maximized it. So design firms from across the country competed for a chance to design this and really heard the input from, from the community that said they wanted to see the return of family supporting jobs, especially in manufacturing, because we have that skill base and, and they, those jobs tend to pay family supporting wages, but they also wanted access to the river and green space because the neighborhoods surrounding the valley have a lower percentage of green space than elsewhere in the community. So this was the vision, the half of the land going to industrial development and half going to park space. Another big piece was managing stormwater where it falls. So Milwaukee, like many cities, is challenged to, to manage stormwater in heavy rain events, um, especially as we think about resiliency and with climate change. How do we capture water where it falls and keep it from leading to really flashy rivers that rise fast, backing up into, into basements? So the goal here was really to capture every drop of rain in any storm event up to a hundred year flood, collect it from, from the building rooftops, from the streets, and send it into a stormwater treatment system filled with native plants, similar to the original marshland and wetlands of the valley, and let that hold that first flush of stormwater until it gradually was able to be soaked into the, the soils beneath and also have trails running through that so that you could still have access to the land up to a hundred year storm event. So this was the, the original concept. This was how it was designed. And uh, about two years after the infrastructure was built, we did have a hundred year storm event and the, the stormwater park functioned exactly as designed. 
that held that water, that first flush, and you can see how it looks like we've got a series of ponds lined up parallel in Canal Street. But within two days, everything was dry. It held that water so it didn't run into the, the river or back up anywhere else into sewer systems, but it treats it. So everything coming off the contaminants from roadway waste are, are captured so that by the time the water filters its way into the Menominee River, it's cleaned. Another goal of that project and part of that roadmap for how to, how to get to that vision was creating a plan for job creation and what that impact of development really should be. So we knew that it would be easy to sell that land that was so close to highway infrastructure to developments for warehousing and distribution. And it, there are a lot of reasons it makes sense to put warehousing and distribution close to freeways. But when we also had the neighborhoods with the highest unemployment and unemployment rates in the state um, within a three mile radius, it became imperative to the city of Milwaukee that that land also be used for job creation. So the city of Milwaukee adopted a set of development objectives that really looked at the types of jobs, the wages for the jobs, and, um, and the job density. So you couldn't build a, a big warehouse with a couple guys running a forklift. You had to have about 22 jobs per acre, which is in the mid to high range for manufacturing. So all of those jobs also had to pay what was set as the benchmark for a um, family supporting wage plus benefits. And that was a huge leap of faith by the city to, to put standards on land that, you know, just a few years before no one wanted to touch and say that this will only be sold to companies who are bringing good jobs back to the city. And sticking to those guidelines, redirecting companies that didn't quite fit to other areas in the community enabled the Menominee Valley Industrial Center to, to actually exceed all of those goals. So the goal was to have 1,294 jobs, and now we have well over 1,400. And they pay good wages, um, and it's really been a success story and on the economic and job creation front. And that same project, the Menominee Valley Industrial Center, has also been a success on the environmental front as well, because the same project had sustainable design guidelines adopted. So everything that's been built on this land that people thought was really dirty and potentially dangerous has been built to these environmental standards that really set the tone for, for the future. So they're green buildings. They, they all achieve different things through daylighting or energy efficiency, but we've seen that really be a success in having um, buildings that operate efficiently and sustainably also help to attract companies that were interested in sustainability as part of their, their business line. Um, so what seemed like a really high hurdle early on when sustainability was barely a buzzword uh, has really helped attract high quality companies who are interested in being on a redeveloped brownfield, being part of a success story and showcasing what about them is a sustainable company. And we're still undertaking those, those lessons learned because there's still a lot of land left to develop, largely riverfront land, but so like this, we can see that we still have vacant tracts of land right now that are just used for, for storage and construction staging, but that there is a vision for creating a mix of um, industrial and retail. The goal for the remaining land in the valley is light food manufacturing, something that has uh, makes use of the industrial zoning and the fact that you can run trucks and activity here 24 seven, but also has some sort of front of factory retail where people can come either to a beer garden or a restaurant or a retail along the riverfront that activates that riverfront space. We've seen a couple of breweries move back to the valley, kind of fitting in with this vision for the land currently here. And, and we're hoping that in about five years, the, that vacant land will look like this with new buildings, public access to the Menominee River, a river walk, fishing piers, and more ways to get people activated in this space. 
The second big lesson that was uh, taken away from the Wisconsin Policy Forum study was the importance of strong intergovernmental cooperation and public-private partnerships. One of those partnerships I mentioned a little bit ago was the partnership between the city of Milwaukee and the Wisconsin Department of Transportation and the reconstruction of the Marquette Interchange and raising land out of the floodplain elsewhere in the valley. So because those partners were at the table and talking to each other, they realized some synergies. The city had land in a floodplain that needed to be raised. Um, the DOT had a lot of fill coming from the Marquette Interchange and, and then the actual crushed concrete from the, from the old highway itself. So together that saved the city millions of dollars in, in infrastructure improvements. It also saved 75,000 truckloads of material from going to a landfill. It built the topography of Three Bridges Park as a teaching tool for the Urban Ecology Center and a connection point uh, to connect across the railroad into the neighborhoods. And all that fill also lines both our roadways and Canal Street and the Hank Aaron State Trail. So every time you're on the Hank Aaron State Trail through the valley, that's, that's old Marquette Interchange you're riding on and just an example of a great partnership in bringing, bringing people together. And another example of that was the whole construction of Three Bridges Park. Um, people often ask, like, who is the city land or county? Who manages this park? And we always say it's, it's com that's a simple question with a very complicated answer because there are a lot of partners even today, now that the park is built, who are responsible for managing it. This park was built as a, as a combination of uh, bike and walk to work routes from surrounding neighborhoods, as well as uh, restoration of natural resources and um, at public access to the Menominee River, as well as an outdoor classroom for the Urban Ecology Center. So all these partners came together. The Department of Transportation actually built the park and its trails. The Department of Natural Resources manages the trail itself. Um, the city of Milwaukee um, owns and maintains the bridges and lighting, and the Urban Ecology Center manages the landscapes, and Menominee Valley Partners um, raised an endowment to fund the park in perpetuity, so managed that, that financial piece to, um, to maintain the landscapes in the park. So those partnerships between public and private entities and between public entities themselves have really been the strength, and I think those partnerships from the early days and the infrastructure projects like the Hank Aaron State Trail and Canal Street continue today in new and sometimes surprising ways. The next lesson learned was the importance of creatively assembling funding from numerous resources. So as an example, again, Three Bridges Park um, used funding from so many different places. Um, there were partners who came together because it was a transportation connection a workforce connection. There were some who came and with funding because it was about restoring natural resources, um, creating healthier waterways and managing stormwater where it falls. Some partners were really interested in the environmental education and some especially in the science education where neighborhood schools may not have been always meeting standards and goals for science education for their students. Having a place where students could really come and bring science to life by doing hands-on activities was inspiring. And some partners came because of the whole, the, the tackling of interconnected issues together. But that funding came in from so many different resources. This slide is just maybe a quarter of a long sheet that just shows how many different sources were involved in just building the infrastructure for Three Bridges Park. That there was transportation, there was environmental cleanup, there was infrastructure and economic and, and, and community science as part of that funding mix. But really the, the reason that this was successful was because all of this funding could be leveraged. One source leveraged another and it was working together to, to really create a transformation as a whole. 
Another of the recommendations from the study was really aggressively marketing the existing strengths of the area. So in the early days of the valley, when we, it was still mostly vacant land, mostly still standing abandoned factories of Forgotten River, when it was just a vision of what it could be, that marketing was really important. And that was playing off of the strengths already there. The proximity to the resources, to downtown Milwaukee, to uh, highway infrastructure, to connect to markets like Chicago and Madison. The importance of having a deep water port nearby for manufacturers to ship goods around the world. Another piece of our, our strength was the workforce. The Valley was surrounded by a ready and willing workforce that had strong roots in, in manufacturing. The Midwest has a great work ethic and we had great technical college systems and university systems willing to work with employers moving into the region to help upskill residents into the jobs that were available. So we really worked to market the workforce. And as time grew, we had new strengths to market. As businesses started moving in, we really developed a, a tight business association. Um, it took a, a certain type of person and a certain type of company to move here in the early days when there was a lot of vision, but a, not a lot of, um, of substance yet happening. And those were really pioneering people who were willing to dig in and be part of a change. And they really worked to, to market the land and um, business location to, to fellow business owners to talk to other potential employees about what it was like to work here, that it wasn't what people perceived as being a dirty, dangerous place, that it was really a place where, where you could be part of change. And then today we can market a whole nother level of strengths. This is the stretch of the Menominee River right by the ballpark. Employees often will go fishing before work or on a lunch break or after work, walk to catch a ball game, go to a brewery. Um, we have a lot of employers who do company-wide kayaking events or biking events on the trail, things that really are amenities that, that you couldn't envision years ago. But from the beginning, marketing what assets you have. And some of those are, are much broader, like just the location or proximity to workforce, but with time, those became much more um, tangible. Again, one of the other recommendations, and I think I've mentioned this a few times already, but it's so important and I think is woven throughout everything in the transformation story of the Valley, is addressing multiple community objectives at the same time. I refer back to the old Milwaukee Road Shop site, which is now the Menominee Valley Industrial Center with more than 1,400 jobs and Three Bridges Park with acreage of park and Hank Aaron State Trail, access points to the Menominee River for kayaking, canoeing, and fishing, and the Urban Ecology Center. Really, these were all interconnected issues that Milwaukee as a community faced. The vacant land, the environmental issues on the vacant former industrial land, um, the lack of access to, to jobs, the difficulty of getting to, into the Valley, but tackling all of those at once um, and really seeing this as a combined vision. So we, we worked as partners with um, Menominee Valley Partners, the city of Milwaukee, the Depart Departments of Transportation, Natural Resources, the Urban Ecology Center, and many others in the community um, to really look at this comprehensively. And that led to the leveraging of funding mentioned earlier. Um, it led to a lot more partners at the table because people came for different reasons, whether they were interested in, in education or job access or economic development. There was, there was something here that connected. And so the ability to, to take these not as silos, but as to bring partners together to solve interrelated problems. The whole story of the Valley's decline is an interrelated story of jobs moving and um, companies moving and an environment that was put down at the 
bottom of the priority list. And the redevelopment and transformation of it is about undoing that and taking on all of those issues simultaneously. Um, and that's been really a part of that success. And then the recommendation that the policy form noted as well that was more of a struggle for us early on was workforce development to connect jobs to neighbors. In some ways, it seemed like that might happen organically. Like historically, when the valley first developed and industry was just moving in, those neighborhoods grew up around the valley as walk to work housing and the residents supported those those companies. But after um, after years of of vacancy in the valley and companies now returning that that connection was not organic. And so it's a lesson that we've been slowly learning um, how to how to really make those connections between residents who are looking for jobs or or looking for that that pathway and to get to some of these more um, in demand careers that require new skills and expertise and how to connect the businesses here who may be coming in with um, existing partnerships and staffing agencies or um, certain schools that they always hire from, how to reframe looking into the neighborhoods and connecting um, to those, those populations who live nearby but aren't being marketed to for those jobs. Because when you, when you look at it, we've got the spatial, spatial mismatch. There are jobs right here in the valley, but there are residents who don't have good jobs and they weren't quite meeting. So a lot of the work that we've been doing now is really to, to make those connections, to, to bring the job fairs into the neighborhood, to create tours both in person and now online to show what it's really like, what a day in the life of working for a company is, what these types of careers actually look like. And also to, um, to practice those skills like interviewing. And um, so we're doing a lot more of that in the neighborhoods and also a lot of connecting students who live in the neighborhoods and are at high schools in the area to those career paths. We find a lot of students just don't even know the, the range of, of jobs available in engineering or manufacturing or any of the, the more than 150 companies that are in the Valley today. So bringing them in for tours, um, having opportunities to, to see what it's really like and then working with the schools as well to transfer what students are learning in their classroom into um, real life application in a company. So if you're learning about torque and gears or structures and basic engineering concepts, being able to do something hands-on at a company that puts those concepts uh, to life and then see how it's actually used. We find that that's really been eye-opening that students today don't have much of much visibility into what happens in, in a lot of different workplaces, most notably manufacturing. But doing those hands-on projects really piques interest and is helping to connect um, even by word of mouth. What, what's available and what are those career paths worth pursuing here? Um, so those were the, the main takeaways from the Wisconsin Policy Forum report. And then I just had a couple more just from um, my own experience to share. One was the importance of having vision and taking big leaps of faith. And so I think the whole story of the transformation of Milwaukee's Menominee River Valley is, is about those two things. So it took a big vision to, to look at this site, this former Milwaukee road shop site, what you saw coming into Milwaukee and really envision that being what the community wanted, both a center for jobs and outdoor recreation. Um, and it took a leap of faith. The city acquired that property to make that possible because it was, um, it was too important to, to leave to chance that someone would come in and redevelop that on their own and find a way to balance those two seemingly conflicting, but actually really um, important uh, uses together. So today, that, that, this is that same site with all of these jobs here, but also that green space in front of the industrial center is used for soccer 
So employees who work there might have kids on soccer teams, community members from the neighborhoods come in, kids from both sides of the valley play together. Um, so ways that we're overcoming that division, that the valley's history of just being that divide and bringing people together both for jobs and for recreation and just getting to know their neighbors. So that, that bridging was a huge leap of faith um, for the city to invest in this property. And then on, on the environmental side as well, you know, when our river looked like this, like, like something no one would actually think of as a river, for companies to move adjacent to this property and believe in that vision that something would happen here and take that leap of faith to be the first one to say, I believe that this vision will happen and that we need to be part of it. And it, that has come to fruition. Now we see people kayaking that same stretch on a regular basis. Um, group tours, company outings on the river, neighborhood gatherings at the water. But that was all a big leap of faith to believe that this could be possible here. Finally, knowing that this all takes perseverance and then paying attention to the, um, knowing that this, this large, project, that these large transformations will take perseverance and having the patience to see that through as well in finding those small moments to celebrate along the way. So one of the examples I use for that is the, the tree planting. You know, it's, it's said that it, it takes a hundred years to grow a hundred year old tree. And sometimes people forget that. Um, it does, all of these things take time and it took us generations to cycle through all of the, the valley has been through. But having, having children take part in that, to be that next generation growing trees, to plant them, finding those, those spaces where people can really dig in and build something for the next generation. Grandparents planting trees with their children is one of those moments we celebrate um, doing the, for what's next. And finally, the, my final point is that all of these partnerships that are at the core take time and trust and goodwill. And you never know where those will lead. So from the creation of Three Bridges Park to new projects today that we never would have envisioned, we find that those, those partnerships between all these different agencies coming with different visions, different hopes, but the desire to really make our community stronger has led us to new and better places. So taking that time to, to, to build trust and um, set a vision and leverage resources together has really been part of that, um, that key element of success. So I'm really grateful that you joined me today for the, hearing about the transformation of Milwaukee's Menominee River Valley and hope that you'll have an opportunity to come down and visit it sometime in the future. Thank you so much for, for listening.